On the wall in front of you, you meet the descendants of the 1901 union of Jack Powell, a lumberjack who'd made his way to this area from Michigan, and Mary Ottertail, a young member of the Anishinaabe tribe, whose people have lived on the border lakes for several hundred years. Because of the disapproval of her family, Jack and Mary moved to Basswood Lake near Ely. The couple and their three small children later moved to the east end of Sagnagans Lake, Lake and established a homestead. Their three sons and two daughters learned the traditional crafts and the subsistence way of life from their mother and learned to read and write and were influenced by their father's connections to the outside world. Here you have a simplified version of the family tree, first two generations. Andrew and Mary and their five children, Esther, Michael, Benjamin, William, and Tempest. The full family tree is on the wall before you. Therein lies the story too. When I when I, I guided for many years, you know, at the end of the trail and all over the country, and people would ask me, say, "Where'd you go to school?" And I'd just tell them, "I never went to school." They'd get right close to you then and talk slow and make motions. <laughs> <laughs> Whether one was born into or married into the Powell family, everyone participated in hunting, trapping, and gathering. In fact, the women were rumored to be the experts. Furs are best harvested in the late fall and winter when they are at their thickest. They are stretched and stitched into place on sapling hoops to cure. Mary Ottertail taught her husband and children the secrets of where and how to harvest pelts and furs. Jack Powell and Mary Ottertail ran trap lines on Sagnagons and throughout the surrounding lakes and forests. Snowshoes and dog sleds were their only transportation. Small trappers' cabins were built at remote locations so the trappers could have a warm, dry shelter to spend the night when venturing far from home. These trapper cabins and roots were used for many decades by Jack and Mary and their growing family. It's remembered that Jack would venture out in the fall, clearing the portages to the trapper cabins, chinking the logs with moss, putting up firewood supplies, and adding hay to the primitive beds. When winter came, it was often the women and older children who worked the trap lines. To augment their income, Jack and the children found work for the Canadian government. When Mike was 15, he and Jack served as fire rangers. Records list them as earning $750 apiece for the year. Mary Ottertail also passed on her knowledge of traditional Anishinaabe crafts, in particular bark weaving, beading, and porcupine quill work. She made and decorated a Tiknagon for each new child and grandchild that arrived. <laughs> the 
the family raised vegetables to supplement their fish, game, and berry diet. Jack brought a cow home so they could have fresh milk. They ventured to Whitefish and Basswood Lakes with other local Anishinaabe families to harvest wild rice. They became skilled cabin builders and often hired themselves out to construct cabins. They would set up a temporary camp for themselves to live in while they built. The stories from Mary's Anishinaabe roots and Jack's Irish heritage were woven into the lives of the children and the grandchildren. You always say to us now, you remember that old woman coming through the woods with the kettle. So I can't even think of her name now, it's an Indian word. Um, <laughs> And then, of course, there was uh, Nana Bijou. And we had be, we were more afraid of him because he could turn into anything at all. Daddy always said, now be careful. You know, you see an old log that's rotten. Don't step on it because Nana Bijou could be in there. He changed into an old log. And he, he'll get even with you. He'll hurt you. Milt Powell remembers summer mornings fondly. Everyone gathered at Jack and Mary's place, with grandkids all sleeping in the living room. Jack would rise before everyone and brew a huge bowl of strong tea with sweetened condensed milk, giving everyone a little sip. Then Jack would sing a familiar song. Oh, it's nice to get up in the morning, ah, oh, but it's nice to, to lie in your bed. And, Sir, I believe in that myself as far as I can see. Early to bed and early to rise will make you healthy, wealthy, and wise. Now get back to bed, kids. <laughs> <laughs> My brother Jock is a big Baker person. son. He sleeps so long with me. And in the winter morning, Jock was to rise and start his work at three. Before he gets his trousers on, his legs are nearly numb. While he's standing shivering, I lie in my bed and I hum. Oh, it's nice to get up in the morning. Oh, it's nice to lie in your bed. Now get back to bed, kids. <laughs> Every morning you sing that. A child's character was formed to honor nature, respect the rules of life in the woods, and greet every day with a smile. Family life was filled with lots of smiles and tender moments. It's been told that Nokomis, Grandma Mary, Touch the head of each grandchild as a tender greeting. Jack and Mary's oldest children, Esther and Mike, married and later moved into town. Frank and Bill married sisters from Tower and started resorts on Sagnaga. Tempa stayed close to her parents. After marrying Irv Benson, she and Er built a cabin for Jack and Mary on Sagnaga. They saw to it that her parents were cared for in their later years. Frank and Bill bought a float plane in Ely and learned to land by watching the loons. They became talented mechanics out of necessity, patching parts together from whatever was on hand. Mike and Tempest guided fishermen for other resorts, while Bill and Frank were kept busy guiding their own guests. Grandchildren learned the ropes early and began guiding as pre-teens.
but you can't even imagine. At one time, right where you're setting, there was more licenses sold, fishing licenses, than any other issuer in Ontario. Now that's hard to believe. <laughs> but we sold, li Sherry can remember this, we sold licenses here you couldn't even it believe. It was constant, I mean, all yeah. day long, one yep, right yeah. after the other. People well, waiting. Yeah, yeah. Hmm. Fishing was maybe a little better back then than it is today? Well, back then there was no walleyes. Oh. You know, it was northerns and lake trout. Yeah. That was it. Yeah. I remember the first, <clears throat> I can remember this very clearly when I was a little kid. My folks went out fishing and they came back with about a three pound walleye and we'd never seen that before. Hmm. And we hmm. thought that was really something. And all of a sudden, in a couple of years, you could go any place in this lake and catch a walleye. I'll be there. It didn't matter if you were four feet or forty feet. There was a walleye. They came that yep. fast. Were they stocking yeah. them, or were no, they just came in naturally? Art Nunstead planted them in the lake. The guy that originally built Chickwa. Yeah. Huh. So it was very interesting. Yeah. Yeah. So it was very interesting, and I think about it now. But I think back, and I say, you had the best children, you know, to play with. You had the best life in the world. You couldn't replace it with nothing nowadays. <laughs> But everyone should be able to celebrate your culture and to learn about it and be immersed in it. Otherwise, be proud of it. Be very proud of it. Otherwise, you're not living your best life. And if I can, I mean, granted, it was a few generations ago, Chief Blackstone. I am a direct descendant of Chief Blackstone. And that's amazing. To